You asked. <laughs> Um, I have a question. So sure. I come from two anomalies. Um, my father's 93. He's right. been diabetic since he's 42. Oh. The doctor keeps saying to him, you're still alive? Yeah. Every time he walks in, I said, yeah. you should get a new doctor. He's a record setter. And he, but here's the interesting thing. Both of my parents, my mom's 90, goes to the gym three times a week in bowls. Right. Her idea of a good meal is a muffin from BJ's and a glass of milk. Yeah the worst eater in, on right. the planet. And right. they have no intellectual stimulation. Lucky you. The best memories, <laughs> my father remembers everything. Yeah. I, it's, it's unbelievable. So here's my question. Obviously, there's some genetic thing going on there. Yeah. How right. do, you, do you see um, uh, that often, first of all, uh, where the genetics are just, where you just scratch your head and go, this is insane. And do you see nutrition playing a role in all of this? Well, uh, first of all, for the, for the genetic thing, what else are they doing? See, and this is a key thing. You know, you, you can say you can, you can eat lots of fat and, um, and, um, and abuse yourself dietarily in all kinds of ways, but maybe you live in an environment where you walk a lot and are physically active a lot and you're very social and uh, you do lots of other things that more than compensate. So people have tried to sort out what it is in diet that really matters, right? I just described people, let's say, from Crete, who are among the longest living in the world. Now, it turns out that if you say, well, where else are the longest living people? Well, well some are in Iceland. Well, they eat a lot of fish, but I don't, and they're probably when they get together, they're pretty social, but I don't know. It seems pretty, they seem pretty dour to me. I'm not really sure. <laughs> Physical activity, though, is big. Physical activity in, in uh, the Icelandic, Icelanders or the Danes or the Nor Nor Norwegians who live pretty long, physical activity is big, and they eat a lot of fish. Now, it turns out that there's a, there's a tribe in, this, in the Amazon that lived to a very ripe old age, and almost all vegetable carbohydrate, heavy carbohydrate, right? Not fish, some fish, but not cold water fish. In their case, it's warm water fish. <coughs> But so not you processed can't, food and not sugar. Right. But a lot of it, a lot of it I, think is, I think that when people think about the, the factors that contribute to longevity, you know, that clearly physical activity, clearly mental engagement are really, really important. Clearly social engagement. You know, if you don't have a daily dose of social interaction, try to figure out how to get one. Invent one, you know, just go down and talk to somebody at the store, for God's sake. <laughs> Do something, right? If you, yeah. Social a a interaction is really important to try to, to try to, all of these things are, are valuable contributors to longevity. Now, one of the things that we're trying to do with computer-based training, and computer-based training can't substitute for a rich social life for the social side, but it can do a lot. You know, we, can do, we know a lot about the engagement, for example, of social cognition in the brain. We know that we can refine it at any point in life, and we know you can do that to some extent on a computer. So what we're trying to do there is to help people, for example, that might struggle to fill in that, to fill in that check off, that, that, that off their list, and so forth. So they are doing things in their life that are beyond their genetics that are positive, even while they might be doing a thing or two that are negative. Or maybe five, who knows. <laughs> but you are lucky. Let me just say, say one other thing about luck. Uh, I, say, I say this in my book. I made a list in one of the chapters of my book about the things that are known to shorten the time before you become senile. Now, I stopped at about 30. There are probably 100 things in which the epidemiologist said, well, if this happens to you in life, you know, you're going, to get, you're going to get senile earlier. There's a recent study by the, done with uh, 700,000 uh, vets in the VA hospital in San Francisco where they tracked people over a seven-year period. And they said, what's the probability over the seven-year period between, I think it was 62 and 69 years of age, that you would develop uh, senile dementia? And the probability was uh, pretty low, a couple percent. Well, what if it, over the seven years you had a traumatic brain injury, a, mi a mild traumatic brain injury? The probability tripled. You're already vulnerable. 
Get a whack on the head when you're already vulnerable. And the probability that it's going to really matter goes up enormously. There are all kinds of factors, all kinds of things that have to. So even when you think you're genetically safe, you fall off your bike. So, you know, it's really good to take care of your brain no matter what. 